listening to The Critical Hour. I'm Wilmer Leon. I'm joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. The most important issue at the U.N. this week. The most important issue that will be discussed at the U.N. this week will not take place in the General Assembly Hall, but on the sidelines. That is where Ukrainian President Zelensky will meet with leaders from the U.S. and U.K. for the next round of discussions on the U.S.'s granting permission for Ukraine to fire Western long-range missiles deeper inside Russian territory. For insight into this, let's turn to our next guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston, one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled Armed Struggle, Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So President Biden has long boasted that one of his legacies will be having united NATO. That legacy has been replaced or has been placed in jeopardy by Zelensky's long range missile request. That seems to be the escalatory line at which NATO members divide the U.N. And it's it's important, uh, Dr. Horn. For people to to really grasp that the UN was founded in 1945 after World War II, its primary stated mission, maintaining international peace and security. And that mission now seems to uh, have been abandoned. And now it seems to be uh, the, the, the place to, to negotiate whether or not long range missiles should be used as the precursor to starting World War III? Well, I think we need to realize that this harebrained proposal by Mr. Zelensky, it's fair to introduce more strains into the North Atlantic bloc and could actually cause it to splinter. I'm referring, of course, to the fact that the Prague leadership, the leadership in the Czech Republic, which includes a number of former NATO military men, has already conceded that Kiev is going to have to make painful concessions, particularly territorial concessions, in order to bring this conflict to a close. We already know that Budapest, Hungary, Viktor Orban is not on board with regard to a number of not only NATO proposals, but European Union proposals. But on the other hand, we also know that there was a recent so-called bipartisan report commissioned by the U.S. Congress, co-chaired by Eric Edelman, a former State Department honcho, former U.S. ambassador to Turkey, co-chaired by Madam Sixkiller, who, of course, comes from the National Security Division of Microsoft, and they came to a similarly harebrained conclusion which is that the United States, believe it or not, needs to spend more on the military. Why, you ask? Because, according to this bipartisan report, it's not only Russia that needs to be confronted. It is the newly concocted so-called axis of evil, uh, speaking of not only Russia, but China, Iran, and North Korea. According to this report, one of the reasons why Russia has not been brought to his knees is because of support from the other three powers. And so, therefore, if you want to subdue Russia, you have to subdue these other three powers simultaneously. Now, that's more than a notion, needless to say. In any case, if Mr. Zelensky has his fondest wish granted and is given an invitation to join NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization spearheaded by U.S. imperialism, to join it not in years, but according to some, he wants to be inducted within a month. If that particular scheme takes flight, which I doubt that it will, because I think that even the more sober forces in Washington recognize that if that happens within a month, within two months, you would see the launching of World War III. And that is something that may be beyond the kin and capability of U.S. imperialism. Not that they would not want to launch World War III, but they may not necessarily be prepared to launch World War III. Because if you pay attention to their rhetoric, 
they're putting more emphasis on so-called friends and allies, as they're called. That was the import of this anti-China cabal that was meeting in Wilmington, Delaware, at the residence of Mr. Biden just a few days ago in the run-up to the United Nations sessions that are unfolding as we speak. That is also a reason why U.S. imperialism is going to have difficulty rounding up a posse, because if you look simply south of the border, you'll see that Chinese investment is pouring into Mexico. By some measures, in recent months, Laredo, Texas, that dusty southwestern town, was a major port of entry for U.S., uh, outstripping New York City, outstripping Long Beach and Los Angeles. And you can only explain that by reference to the China-Mexico relationship. At the same time, of course, you see that the United States has found a willing friend and ally in terms of the Philippines, which is jousting to its detriment, I might add, with the People's Republic of China in the South China Sea, uh, as we speak, very dangerous on its part, I might say. And I should also add that uh, with regard to the European Union, uh, it's not clear to me that they will be altogether on board with regard to either uh, Kiev entering NATO or even with regard to this World War III nonsense. Because if you look at the recent report commissioned by Brussels and inked by Mario Draghi, the Italian leader, former head of the European Central Bank, it counsels that the Europeans have to spend more trillions of euros in this estimation, not only on defense, but on the economy, but not only to stay competitive with China, but to stay competitive with the United States of America. And in that sense, uh, look at the uh, hefty fine issued against both Apple and Google by Brussels in recent weeks, which did not bring a smile to the bureaucrats in Washington. So at the end of the day, uh, we see that U.S. imperialism and its satraps, such as in Kiev, are snarled in contradictions as complicated as trying to disengage a bowl of spaghetti. Taz reports Africa's exclusion from the UNSC must be addressed, according to uh, leaders from the African Union. Two quick comments. Number one, Africa's not a country, so that makes it a little weird. But the other part being, um, if an African country gets on the US, I, 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 UNSC, I suspect the U.S. will not want them to have the same veto privileges as everyone else. Your thoughts, Dr. Uh, Dr. Horn? Well, the latter point is obvious. And once again, in order to understand this recent proposal endorsed by U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, you have to understand the pressure being placed on U.S. imperialism by China. Recall just a few days ago, the all-important, profoundly important summit between the People's Republic of China and four dozen plus the African heads of state and government. Recall as well that even so-called allies like Turkey are playing a more important role on the continent with every passing day. At the same time, you see that the reliable poodle that is Great Britain, their new government under Mr. Starmer, excuse me, Sir Keir Starmer, is losing altitude and right now may be as unpopular as his predecessor, that of the Tory Rishi Sunak, which obviously is going to circumscribe their ability to maneuver. The ruling Social Democrats in Berlin are losing elections, although they managed to squeeze one out in Breitenberg just the other day, but that is not indicative of the long-term trend. And I should also say that it was quite disappointing that the leader of the United Arab Emirates met in the Oval Office with Mr. Biden just in the last 24 hours. And just as with the visit to the Oval Office last year, a Prime Minister Maloney of Italy, perhaps the most anti-African leader ruling today, which is saying something given the competition, the UAE is playing a very damaging and negative role in Africa, particularly in the Sudan, where it is playing a muscular role and stirring up conflict between the so-called rapid support forces, which they support, and the military government in Khartoum. And yet, 
Mr. Biden met with this leader of the UAE with hardly a peep, as I could tell, of coming from the anti-imperialist movement in this country, such as it is. And this does not bode well with regard to Africa being able to avoid the manipulation of U.S. imperialism, because we recognize that it's not only the Security Council that we need to be reforming, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, all of the above need to be subjected to reform that would lead to more inclusion of African states. And we also know that China is in favor of this reform, not least because it's part of their enlightened self-interest. That is to say, as the Europeans and the United States seek to clamp down on the Chinese economy, particularly barring its exports, such as these $10,000 electric vehicles, which Mr. Trump wants to subject to 100% or more tariffs, the Chinese are going to look for markets in Africa, particularly on the eastern coast of Africa. And therefore, this is going to complicate relations with U.S. imperialism and also ensnarl the effort of Washington to use Africa as some sort of puppet. Burkina Faso announces intention to join BRICS. Uh, yesterday, the uh, Burkina Bay prime minister held a meeting with the Russian ambassador during which they discussed bilateral cooperation in the spheres of nuclear energy, economy, and politics. And one can only uh, figure that if uh, Burkina Faso is heading in that direction, then the other uh, uh, a lot countries in the alliance of Sahel states will uh, will will follow suit. So as the United States continues to champion militarism, uh, BRICS is channeling uh, and promoting financial independence and alliance. You are correct with regard to the supposition that if Burkina Faso seeks to join the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, not far behind will be its comrades in Niger and Mali, uh, perhaps Algeria as well, a major natural gas producer, perhaps uh, Benin and Togo as well, uh, also former French colonies, perhaps the Republic of the Congo. Speaking of Congo, Brazzaville, a former French colony, which will, in a couple of years, host the next major summit between uh, African nations and the People's Republic of China. And of course, by raising the question of expansion of BRICS, we would be remiss if we failed to acknowledge the invitations extended to Ethiopia and Egypt and Iran and Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, we should also remind the audience that not far behind might be Indonesia, the largest, most populous, predominantly Muslim nations, perhaps Turkey, the eastern flank of NATO. And if the diplomacy can be worked out, perhaps the most sizable Spanish-speaking nation, speaking of Mexico, which is now hooked into the North Atlantic Free, free Trade Agreement uh, that uh, in, is led by the United States of America. But once again, the United States is handicapped with regard to trying to attract these African countries away from BRICS because of its bloodstained record in the African slave trade and its absolute refusal and failure to pay reparation to the descendants of enslaved Africans. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Greatly, greatly appreciate that analysis, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you.